And for our first panel discussion of the day, please to uh, bring Ida Ekpedum to, uh, to the stage to uh, uh, converse with some great venture capitalists and lawyers in the field. Ida. Thank you so much, Don. Uh, I am so excited to be here. And as a proud Princeton alum, I was really honored to get to be part of the uh, organizing committee. And I was really thrilled that this is a national conversation, that we are really trying to uh, advance Black academic entrepreneurship, and it's going to take efforts across the country to do this. And I'm thrilled to have this group together. And I basically took the last two days off yesterday and today because I really wanted to hear um, what the conversations were about. And there were just so many gems from yesterday's conversations and sessions. Uh, and I, I got to incorporate some of them for today. And one of the most sobering statistics came from yesterday's opening keynote when Gabby Salzberger shared findings from the study she commissioned uh, by the Board of Diversity Action Alliance, which she co-founded with former Xerox CEO Ursula Burns. In case you missed it, you know, I'll recap the thing, the, the points that she made that she brought up that like really kind of opened a lot of our eyes. They studied 18 of the top most influential PE and VC firms and their deals across a 20 year horizon. So from 2000 on, all of these organizations were started by, most, I pretty much, I'm pretty sure all of them were by white men. And there were 843 private companies that have gone public that are now worth more than $10 trillion. And for those companies, there were 4,700 board directors. Of those 4,700, 49 were black and 47 were Hispanic. I mean, Gabby probably believes that in actuality, there were less than 49 or 47 because uh, you tend to use sometimes the same board person across multiple organizations. 21 of the 23 seats held by black board directors of venture backed companies from the last 20 years were filled in the past decade. And when they looked at the C-suite from these companies, the representation there was also pretty poor. So these stats make it clear, you know, the takeaway kind of I took from that and from the various conversations across the course of the day was uh, the importance of relationship because how that leads to access, whether it be to networks, which is ultimately what leads to capital. And what, you know, when Ken uh, Chenault talked about it earlier in the session today, the intentionality with which existing systems must act in order to change the status quo. So anchored in these stats, I want to peel back the onion a, bit, a little bit and bring on an amazing esteemed panel uh, that's going to talk about what we can do from the earliest days to help black founders beat the odds and best position themselves to get on the radars of these top firms. And so I'd love to bring on our panel and I'd like each of them to just briefly introduce themselves. Let's start with you, Sydney. Thanks for that great introduction. Um, my name is Sydney McLaurin. I'm a partner at Material Impact. Uh, I'm an engineer by training, so I spent my early career at Siemens. Um, so I spent about six years there um, understanding sort of big culture, a big company culture. Um, I realized that I really liked uh, two things. So one was solving environmental issues, solving really big environmental challenges. Um, and the second was building companies, right? I realized, you know, that those are two areas of interest for me. Um, I transitioned over uh, you know, via business school. So I went to Duke for business school uh, and transitioned over into early stage startups uh, and venture capital. So that's where I am today. Um, the first startup I did straight out of business school, um, I was the first several general manager at Lime, uh, which is a scooter company, which uh, many of you probably now know, now, probably now know. Um, when I first started, um, it was kind of funny because people asked me why I left business school and uh, sold bikes. So that was, uh, that was kind of a fun thing. Um, Spent about three years at Lime, uh, launched their first several market, and then um, ended up running about about half the world for them um, by the time I left, uh, and then transitioned over to Metro Impact. Um, and Metro Impact, I do a lot of early stage ideation work uh, for the firm and working with the, some of the earlier stage concepts that we have, forming them into companies and thinking about sort of how we structure them. So definitely right up the alley for a lot of um, you who are thinking about spinning out technology and those types of things. Um, I spend a lot of time in that world right now. Um, and I'll also do some more traditional um, Series A work on on some companies in our um, in our portfolio. So, thanks for the time and really excited. Thank you for being here. I, I, I laugh because my Nigerian parent mind was in like, ah, ah, 
did we come to America for you to sell bicycles? <laughs> so that just like immediately cracked me up, but a really great Jennifer. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jennifer Gill Roberts, and I'm in Silicon Valley, a California native, and I've spent the last three decades um, as a technologist, as a repeat entrepreneur, and as a VC. My current fund, Grit Ventures, invests in super early stage companies in AI, robotics, and clean energy. And we like to focus on applications in core industries, so construction, agriculture, logistics, manufacturing. We have a sourcing strategy that's focused on universities, and we have investment hubs across the US, so California, Texas, Colorado, and Pennsylvania. My partner, Christy Cardenas, is in Austin. And as part of our sourcing and talent strategy, we created Grit Labs, which includes our academic council, our university fellows program, which is women and underrepresented minorities in master's and PhD programs, and our corporate partners. Um, and I'm very excited to be here. Thank you. Rachel? Hello, everyone. My name is Rachel Golston. I'm a venture capital attorney. Um, what that means on the company side is that I help early stage and growth stage companies um, on the legal side for a lot of companies that don't have general counsels. I am their outside general counsel, essentially. Um, I act as a counselor, I act as an advisor, um, help them through formation and financing and ultimately exit. Um, I am a bit of a 360 VC lawyer in the sense that I also represent venture capital funds. And I, I do fund formation and advising um, regulatory compliance and capital deployment on the VC fund side as well. Fantastic. And last but not least, Ed. Thanks. Um, so I overlap with Rachel. Uh, I'm a partner at Lowenstein Sandler in New York, where I've been working for 30 years um, and started teaching startup law and internet law at Rutgers Law School in Newark, um, and then switched over for the last 16, 17 years to teaching venture capital and angel investing in the MBA program at Columbia. I'm an angel investor in more than 150 companies, and I'm also an LP in more than 150 venture funds, uh, most recently through a vehicle I started with my wife and some friends called First Close Partners, which is a continuation of work that my wife and I have been doing, investing in venture capital funds anywhere in the world that are founded and run by underrepresented investors. Love it. And so, you know, everybody can see now why this group uh, was a great and ideal team to have this conversation with. And I know when, you know, everybody talks venture and they're thinking, let's talk about the fundraising, let's get right into it. How do we get the money? But one of the key things I took away yesterday was particularly that when innovations are coming out of academic institutions, it is the critical importance of securing the intellectual property from which such a ventures are birthed. So I actually wanna start with our lawyers um, and you know, no company is right or is set up for success if it's not done so properly from the outset. So if somebody's considering you know, translational, commercializing academic IP, what kind of legal considerations should they be thinking about? And more importantly, when uh, should they be thinking about it? Knowing that, as I've come to learn, you know, there's different types of lawyers for different types of things. So maybe Rachel, kick us off. Sure. Um, so I, my perspective is probably going to be a little bit different than um, if you asked a lawyer that specifically focused on um, one area, representing venture, um, representing sort of venture capital firms and startup companies, a lot of the times, very early stage companies, you kind of wear multiple hats for them. And um, at Mintz, because, and, and Lowenstein is similar, because we're sort of a one-stop shop that has um, a lot of different subgroups within our practice, you know, I have IP colleagues, I have employment colleagues. So my job is really to figure out um, how to set the company up in a way that the IP can be properly transferred, how to set the company up in a way that um, they have the capitalization that they need to be able to incentivize talent. And so stepping back from even thinking about, you know, sort of how to get money in and how to get the IP in is sort of, where are you putting it into? And um, having a lawyer on the team, having an accountant on the team or someone who can help with your finances is really important for those 
those early stage conversations about the way you want to set the business up that you're um, ultimately going to be capitalizing and bringing property into. Absolutely. Ed, anything to add to that? Um, I, I really liked Rachel's uh, answer and explanation. Um, so let me uh, plus one. And I, I think understanding that sometimes as a matter of law or contract, including if you're using university sponsored um, intellectual property, you might not own it. You might not have the right to convey it. And unless there are magic words put on a piece of paper, virtual or physical, you don't uh, have the right to convey it. And so just making sure that it has been properly conveyed, I think is, is really important. And then um, to amplify Rachel's uh, comment about capitalization, we see a lot of sloppiness in how equity has been issued or equity has been contemplated, but not actually papered. And that yields tax problems and tax problems are painful and expensive to solve. And if we backdate tax problem solutions, we end up getting um, orange jumpsuits. So you don't want to do backdating of equity grants ever. So making sure that you've papered things properly and that you've at least checked in with someone on the tax issues is important when it comes to issuing equity to people. And I, and I think, you know, when you start talking legal things, you start thinking billable hours. And I, I always, when I talk to my lawyer friends and they're like, I can break things down by six minute increments. And I'm just like, wow, that leads to a lot of dollar signs. So when you don't want to freak yourself out thinking about how much it costs and then stop yourself from innovating, are there ways to start thinking about these legal implications if you're not, you know, in a position to drop, you know, thousands and to get it to start the right path of thinking about thinking about putting it together properly, but you might not be ready to, you know, have raised anything to help you get those that capital together to support great legal teams like yours. What are the resources that can help you start on the right path? Do you have any suggestions? So um, I'll start. So what I, the first thing I'll say is it's very expensive to do it wrong and fix it later. It's much more expensive than doing it right the first time. Um, so sort of the, the, you know, measure twice, cut once. <laughs> um, so, it, but it is not uncommon for us to get in um, early stage companies that have used like LegalZoom or sort of online legal resources for setup. And those are great, you know, affordable options if you know what you're doing. Um, but a lot of the times people don't realize the law is behind issuing securities. Like anytime you're issuing securities, even when you're issuing them to co-founders um, or employees, there are laws that govern like what you can and cannot do and the way you can issue those securities. Um, so thinking through things like the jurisdiction you want to be formed in, um, any other jurisdictions you might have to file in, you know, um, as Ed mentioned, there's tax considerations and those tax considerations start early. So for example, if you issue restricted stock and you don't file your 83B election in 30 days, you've blown the, the ability to do that. And so like, that's something that, you know, as a lawyer, I can say, hey, just so you know, as soon as you issue this, you need to file this with the IRS. And this is, you know, there's, and, and again, back to having your lawyer and your accountant, those are like the two, um, two important pieces of what I would call like sort of your founding board. So not necessarily a board of directors, but the board of people who are going to help you get where you need to be. That being said, legal services, particularly for um, law firms that do, that work with startups, like we know the money's not there yet because we're helping you do your series seed and your note financing. So a lot of firms have flat rates for getting set up. They have like startup packages. They have um, alternative fee arrangements. They have deferrals to your first closing, which is very common um, in, in the projects that I work on. And so I think one thing I would say is um, don't hesitate to ask what the fees are and how fees will be structured and for alternative arrangements. Um, because you might be surprised at what the actual cost is and, and, the, and sort of the efficiencies around doing it right the first time. That makes a lot of sense. And, you know, Ed, I want to dig in on, you started saying this about uh, the conversation around founder dynamics and equity and kind of thinking through those. So when you're thinking about that, those conversations of a founding team uh, and equity, how soon should you think about putting in writing what you're like, oh, we're doing this together, but you may not paper it. Um, talk to us about the importance of that as a tease up 
for when Sydney and Jennifer start looking at things and we start looking at cap tables and all of those kinds of things, the importance of those early conversations about equity and roles and responsibilities. So Rachel raised two um, points that I think are, are super important here. Um, and the good news is that you only worry about having screwed up the equity issuance if the company actually succeeds. So you don't have to worry about it if the company craters, right? Um, so if you think the company is likely to succeed, you should issue the equity. And, you know, Rachel referenced Section 83B. You want to have a dynamic arrangement where people are subjecting their shares to vesting over time, because if they leave the venture, you're going to need that equity back. And that's something that you generally want counsel to help with. You can kick the can down the road and lots of people do that. But if someone leaves and they own equity and it was not properly papered or they own the equity outright and there was no vesting and they left, even though you said, we'll agree to vesting later, that can actually really impair your ability to get financing because you now have to move things around and early stage investors don't love to have a cap table where people who worked at the company for three or six months and left own a huge chunk of the business. Absolutely. And, and to that point, let's, let's talk about the people that are putting money into these entities. Uh, Sydney and Jennifer, let's assume, you know, they got these things started off right and you're, you're interested. When you're looking at these founding teams and both of your organizations do look to academic IP and commercializing them, what are kind of trends that you see in strong founding, uh, founding and senior leadership teams uh, that you're looking at? Sydney? Yeah, I would say the first thing is complementary skill sets. Um, you know, when you look at um, a lot of teams, I think the, the teams that are the hardest to fund are, are often solo founders who are trying to do everything. Uh, and so, you know, thinking about sort of who are those early people, um, I think on the, on the flip side of that, really big teams tend to be hard to fund as well, right? So if you have a team of, you know, six people, right, it's, it's just harder to understand at the early stage what the economics will be and sort of which of those team members are going to be there for a long period of time. And so somewhere in between that one to, I would say, five number tends to be a, a pretty good number. Most often, I think we see two to three, to be honest, um, on our side. Um, which is two to three founders um, with complementary skill sets. Um, and then the second thing I would say is, uh, you know, having people who you actually know for a long period of time um, is ideal. Um, it's not always easy to do, right? You know, you start a venture and the people you've known for a long period of time, um, you know, for my case, right? You know, the people who I've known for a long period of time may not be in the same industry, right? A lot of my friends are not in the same, you know, area. Um, but thinking about forming those relationships with people who might have complementary skill sets, even before you start thinking about the venture itself, um, is what I would say there. So a long period of time, you know, a decent period of time might even be a year, right? That might even be two years, um, but that's much better than, hey, I'm about to start this venture. I go on a search and I've now known this person for a day. Uh, and now I'm going to think about starting a company with them. I think you'll find your life just to be much easier uh, if you have some rapport, some working relationship, some understanding of of their strengths and weaknesses and how you work together. Awesome. And Jennifer, in the session right before this, um, Jody Simone talked about academics that end up turning and running a business, like he became the CEO. That's often not necessarily the case when you think of the team dynamics of the founding team. What do you, what are your thoughts on academics and business people pairing together as they build teams uh, and, and building that robust kind of team complementary skill set Sydney speaks about? You're on mute. You're on mute. So um, in deep tech, what we typically see is um, a company that's being spun out of the labs. So they would have a working prototype. Um, they might have a faculty member, some graduate students, even some postdocs or undergrads, people that were associated with that research. Um, and it may have gone on for a long time. They may have raised a lot of money. You know, now they have something that they can take to market. They actually may have done customer discovery and have a pilot lined up, right? So it's getting real and it's exciting. And it's like, who's going to go with this project? And so I think one question 
for the faculty member is, do you want to take a leave of absence, right? You can't take a big chunk of equity and then be part time, you know, or maybe it makes more sense for that faculty member to be on the board, but not take a day to day role and then obviously make their equity according to that. Um, in, in schools that have had mature entrepreneurial programs like Stanford, I do see um, a pairing of business school students with, you know, School of Engineering. Um, maybe they meet in coursework around entrepreneurship, or maybe they meet at incubators. Um, there's all kinds of ways in which that happens, often through um, student organizations. But I don't see that as much at the schools that are um, very strong in deep tech, but lighter on entrepreneurship. Um, and so those founding teams can be you know, all super technical people. And, you know, we come in and we help them with go to market. And, and one thing that I think um, is important to avoid is making the wrong hires, right? So I tell them, don't rush out to make that business hire um, because you don't need them right now, right? So for that first nine to 12 months, it's gonna be more about trying to figure out product market fit and trying to complete your technical team and, you know, sorting out roles and, and you probably don't need a business person. Um, you do need a CEO that has some business aptitude, um, you know, but I think to the earlier point about um, cap tables, you don't want to give, you know, 10% to some CEO that doesn't work out. Absolutely. And, um, you know, my next question leads into one of the questions into in the chat, which is, you know, both of your firms are highly engaged in sourcing from academic institutions. How do you go about picking the institutions that you're proactively engaged in? And the question in the in the in the chat was, are there particularly particular advantages or disadvantages of university spin outs when raising venture money? Yeah, I can I can start with that one. So um, it's all about relationships for us. So, so the, the reason we tend towards certain um, institutions is because we have standing relationships uh, with those people. And it's less about the institutions themselves and more about individual professors. So they're professors who we know who are who have expertise in certain areas. Um, and so we really want to get to know those, professor, those professors. And so, you know, an example of that is say a professor switches from Northwestern to Harvard. Right. Our relationship, we still want to have a relationship with that professor, right? And so we would have a broader relationship um, with that team. I would say the second sort of big relationship piece is understanding how the university spends things out. So we have deep relationships with the actual commercialization teams um, at those universities. Um, and that that it just streamlines business dealings. We know specific people on the team and we know, uh, you know how it actually works in terms of spinning out, what, what the terms are, what can we get done, what can we not get done. Um, and so again, that just tends to be a relationship, you know, item. Um, outside of that, you know, we're always looking for really smart people, I would say is, is, is more than anything. And so if that smart person is at a university where we don't have a standing relationship, we're happy to make it, right? It, it's not, you know, that the universities we're at right now are the only ones we would ever do. Um, but just think about it as the people and, and making it a really compelling case of, of understanding, you know, hey, this is why you should work with me as a person broader than the university. And then the university is sort of a bonus. It has the other resources and expertise and things to help you help you spin that up. So that, that's how we look at that as a, um, as a whole in terms of, of what universities and people really more than anything we work with. Jennifer? Um, in our case, you know, we obviously started with the schools um, that we had gone to, so Stanford and the University of Texas. Um, but from a thesis perspective, we mapped out um, where are, you know, where are the top 15 schools in AI, robotics, and clean energy? Um, where are those um, government research dollars flowing, which is a good indicator of kind of what's happening in the universities? Um, where are the emerging tech hubs, right? So some have been emerging for 20 years, but they finally arrive like Austin. Um, others, you know, are really just getting started. Um, but we looked at kind of all these factors where are the Fortune 500 companies, where's the tech talent? And we saw some migration of that during COVID and we came up with our cities, right? And we can't cover the whole US and we'll opportunistically invest in, you know, anywhere, but we really wanted to be proactively involved. So um, we're on advisory boards, we give talks, we call them labs to launch. You know, we have our fellows and our academic council, we're on campus. Um, you know, we really uh, need meaningful engagement, I think, to Sydney's point. And 
It's interesting because it wasn't just the schools we attended. Like we went to Carnegie Mellon Cold a few years back and they really welcomed us. <laughs> um, and so we met people in the innovation office at Tech Transfer and faculty and the Entrepreneurial Center. And it was really wonderful to be, you know, welcome like that. Um, so I think it, it's strategic, but it's also, you know, to earlier points, it's about relationships. And, you know, when you think about the hubs and um, just representation. Are you seeing strong uh, pipeline at, in, from your the academic institutions that you're looking at of Black um, ac academics uh, and researchers? And if not, what do you think can be done differently or what are you actually doing uh, by yourselves to, to, do, to move that needle? Yeah, so again, there's huge disparities, right? So like Stanford has 425 labs with commercially applicable research. I just know that number because they have a whole office that focuses on pairing those labs with corporate sponsors. Um, so that's like the extreme. Um, you know, other schools, you can look at how many companies are spun out each year and you can see that they're just getting started. And it could be that they have tech transfer hurdles or the faculty just aren't encouraged to be entrepreneurial, like they can't take a leave or, you know, the students aren't really exposed to it. Um, but I think it's changing rapidly, right? And I think all these universities, I, I think every time I talk to them, they're so interested, you know, in um, hackathons, pitch competitions, entrepreneurial curriculum, you know, people coming from outside and helping them, um, creating facilities that are sort of like, uh, you know, startups in the local community paired with research. And I don't know, so it feels like it's accelerating. And I think that the government dollars is really helping, right? So not just DARPA, but Army Future is giving $80 million, you know, to the University of Texas and the University of Wisconsin, right? Schools that are not on the coast. So I don't know, I see um, an acceleration of this activity everywhere. So yeah, and I, yeah, I certainly agree. I think, um, you know, to Jennifer's point, the, um, the excitement has not caught up with the numbers <laughs> yet, for sure. Um, there, there is certainly still a, a you know, a huge gap. I, I would say one other thing um, that people don't talk about a lot is just a practical uh, implication of starting a company after spending, you know, five years in grad school, right? You, you haven't had an income, you know, for five years in grad school, right? You're coming out. A lot of people have families families, they have you know, sort of responsibilities that they need to cover and they don't have the flexibility to say, hey, I'm going to spend, you know, really, I mean, you, in your mind, you're sort of dedicating right five to 10 years, but even even in the, the real sense right, of just even if it was two to three years, they're saying like, hey, I'm going to take two to three years, you know, with potentially no income to be able to do this. And so um, that disproportionately does impact, uh, you know, minority founders a lot. A lot of the ones I talk to are, are in that situation. And so you know, I think one of the things is figuring out how you create that bridge uh, between sort of academia and um, and whatever that startup is. And so, you know, that could be, you know, structuring when you fund the startup, you know, structuring some sort of salary, right? Although you wouldn't necessarily like at an early stage company have, you know, a salary thinking about how you actually, uh, you know, allow people to be able to, to transition in a way that, that I think takes life into account uh, and allows them to understand like, you know, hey, this is this is something where I have responsibilities in the family, but I still want to get it done. Um, and I think the last thing I would say on that is, um, you know, the the other cool thing, there's sort of the push and pull, right? The university, the institutions really want to do it. Um, and on the other side, there's been a lot of interest from um, young, you know, minority underrepresented entrepreneurs who want to actually start businesses. So so looking at things, you know, they have causes that they really want to impact, right? They have some some place they really want to want to um, sort of change. And so I think the, the 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 environment is very ripe. I think the timing is is, you know, again, we still haven't solved it, but I, I would say trending trend wise, it's, it's heading in the right direction. Absolutely. And I think part of that you talk about the capital. It is important uh, when you're the founder. It is um, and I think, Ed, one of the things that I think is really interesting about you, not just what you do in your day job, but as you talked about your professional of be, of on your private side of being an angel and an LP, I want to I want to hear more about your intentionality with which you talk, you talk about being an LP in funds that have underrepresented GPs who are the ones writing the checks. What is the importance of that as we think about how does capital flow down? to different groups, both from the companies and then from the people writing the checks. Yeah, um, so Venture talks a lot about having 
uh, a differentiated network because you were employee number eight at, you know, fill in the blank, Twitter, Snap, whatever, um, or because you went to HBS or, you know, whatever it is. Um, and I had a conversation just after um, attention was grabbed by the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Dominique Fells. And um, one of the women that we had invested in, we had invested in fund one and fund two, um, or had committed to fund two, said that she was talking to the other black women who run venture funds. And she said, you know, there aren't many of us, we all know each other. Um, and there's no list of who our LPs are. Um, so we've been comparing notes to try to see who the LPs are. And um, there aren't, we think, you know, there are very few people who've invested in three or more black women led venture funds. It turns out you're in all of our funds and we think you may be the most prolific LP in black women led venture funds at the time. Um, and we know that you host events, you do these other things. You don't talk publicly about being an LP, period. Um, and if you did, you could amplify and have more impact. And when I thought about it, you know, one of the things that sort of triggered uh, some real an evaluation of, of how I was going about it was, she said, you have expertise in this portion of the asset class. And as people who look like me were reaching out to me and asking me to introduce them to underrepresented venture funds because they knew that I had been hosting DEI events in tech and venture for years, they would come back and say, I can't, figure, you know, I don't know how to evaluate these funds, which is actually a complete cop out, right? Um, and so if you the think same about, as like, oh, we don't like the, we can't find them. I don't know how to evaluate them. Yeah. It's a pipeline issue, right? It's not a pipeline issue. We, we have first closed partners, which was established in late November of last year has evaluated more than three or 400 funds. It's not a pipeline issue. It's not. Um, so the, the intentionality piece is it turns out that for years, I have intentionally been building a diversified network. That means that my ability to back channel and evaluate cold outreach on a fund that we're looking at right now in Lebanon um, is different than someone else's. It means that my ability to evaluate the two funds we committed to in um, Central Africa different than someone else's because the African diaspora is a, is a network that I have been tuned into for years. In 2013, I wrote this piece in the Wall Street Journal saying that venture was 87% white, 89% male, and 52% had gone to the same 10 universities. That's the same perspective. They're going to ask all of the same questions, and they're going to come up with a lot of the same answers to those questions. So part of the thesis in backing underrepresented led funds is they bring a different perspective, they bring a different set of insights, they bring a truly differentiated network, and that's super valuable, and it's going to also make me a better and smarter investor, and it, it will have impact, because there's also value in, you know, this is a Princeton event, there's value in two white dudes from Princeton having to ask a black woman for money. That's a power shift and that needs to happen more. Absolutely. Um, and I, and I, you know, I see it in my day to day as well. Like our firm, Gingerbread Capital, we have, what is it? Less than 1% of venture capital goes to black women. In our portfolio, we have 10% or more of our portfolio is going to black women. And part of it is because I exist. I am sitting as a partner in a firm where a black woman sees me and reaches out. And it, it is really important to see capital in the hands of check writers that look a bunch of different ways and bring a lot of different diversity to the table. And I think from the standpoint of then getting to that, Rachel, like we, when we were having our conversation, you talked about some of the things about venture that makes it scary, opaque, but that it can be 
overcome if you're coming from the founder side. Uh, what did you talk about it from the standpoint of how you as a founder or that founding team can get on the radars of the Sydneys, of the Jennifers, if you're not maybe coming from one of the institutions they're already working with? Sure. Um, so I think beyond sort of setting up your company in a way that's like, you know, ready to be investable, there is an element of, and, you know, this is a um, an event for academics, there's an element of research that you can do, like, um, you know, being up search engines like Google are amazing. You can you can search for all kinds of things. There are venture capital blogs. There are, um, you know, websites dedicated to helping founders and entrepreneurs. Um, shameless plug: My firm actually has a dedicated venture capital website called Mint's Edge. Um, but beyond the law firm setting and beyond firms, there there is a whole world of VC blogs, of experts. Um, like Ed mentioned his article, there, there is an ecosystem of information available. And I do find that a lot of founders are suffering from an asymmetry of information in part um, because you know, as Ed mentioned, some of these networks are not as readily open, but also they may not be aware that those things are there. There are, there are places you could go. So for example, um, for most companies, when they're getting um, private financings, they're gonna go to the SEC and they're gonna file something called a Form D. If you have a competitor in your space or someone doing something similar in your space and you wanna see kind of, oh, maybe how much did they raise on their on their last financing? A lot of the times before I invest in, in um, companies or look to invest in companies, I actually just like, go to the SEC website and pull up their Form D filings, which, which are public and readily available. You can just search for it and look for, it, for the name. And I see, you know, how much did they raise, how many investors, and it's not perfect because, you know, people raise money, people have closings after their initial closing. Um, but you, there's a lot of information that's there if you know, know where to look and sort of what to look for. Um, so I know that this might seem um, silly to say to this group, but, you know, do your research, but what that research looks like in a VC setting is a little bit different. For example, um, your alumni network of other entrepreneurs who've come from your university, those who have maybe um, commercialized um, you know, like research and development from the university or those who have not, those who are just entrepreneurs who have a product, but they um, you know, went to your school. Um, that can be a really great sort of network and resource for understanding the ecosystem you're entering into. Because I do meet a lot of um, first time founders who do not just understand the way the ecosystem works. Um, and I think the, the experts, the people you, you're able to put on your founding board, whether it's people who are directors of other companies, whether it's alumni who have become entrepreneurs, whether it's your counsel, your accountant, um, that team is really going to be important for helping you get the information you need. For example, I, like, I consider myself a co-founder for a lot of my, um, my clients because I'm right there and I'm going, you know, this isn't a legal point, but your debt could be like five slides shorter. <laughs> and it's because I see decks all the time, right? Because I, I review decks for like legal disclaimers, but I see decks all the time. I see pitch presentations all the time. And so I think having um, people around you and sort of building that team around you, you, you don't necessarily have to go straight for and target the VC firm because you want to get money. There are other people in the VC space, and this conference is a great example of that, um, who can help you get where you need to be and help you understand like what you need to know when you get there. Absolutely. And I think every one of you has said at one point, the power of relationships. This is a relationship game. Uh, and and it, it is crucial that you build that network of relationships. Sydney, talk about the, the importance of meaningful quality versus quantity and why spray and pray, oh, you're an investor? Let me tell you about myself might not always be. Or after you meet somebody one time, oh, will you write me a check for your company? <laughs> Talk about like what it actually means to build these relationships. Yeah, I think um, I think the easy way to explain it is is just think of yourself, right? So think of the people around you who um, you know really well. Like think of the relationships you have with those, and and think of like starting with your family, right? Of like you've known your family, you know, a lot of your family. In some cases, you haven't known them all your life, but um, but a very long time in your life. And then think about the, the newest of your relationships, right? Think about, you know, how you feel about those and how much you'd be willing to do those and, and your value that you place on those. Um, if you look at all that, there's only a certain number of very meaningful relationships that you would place a really high value on, at least in my case, right? So maybe, maybe other people are different, but, um, but that number is pretty low, right? In terms of people who 
you know, when they called me, I would pick up the, you know, I would pick up the phone and help them actively for, you know, a long period of time. Um, and as an investor, that has grown exponentially. Uh, and, and the reason for that is um, this sort of understanding of people who are, are you can tell when people have a, um, a connection that, that they really are, are meeting well, right? You know, and, and what that looks like a lot of times is, um, is prior to funding, right? So, so you're not at your, your inflection point where you're needing capital, but you're thinking about what the business might look like, right? And so you want to have input on thinking about, you know, hey, could you give me feedback on this early concept or could you give me feedback on, on this discussion? Um, and then keeping that relationship over time and sort of thinking about that, you know, checking in periodically, keeping the, the lines of communication open. Um, another good example of that is, is, you know, following up on a regular basis with things that um, the other person might be interested in, right? So doing your research on their interests, doing your research on, on their background and following up. And, and a lot of times it'll be a miss, right? And that's okay. Um, but, but just showing that effort of, of trying to understand that person, trying to really show that you um, care about that person uh, is, goes a really, really long way. I'm um, in a business where, uh, quite frankly, a lot of it is transactional, right? A lot of the relationships you have, a lot of the conversations you have are transactional. And so it really um, stands out uh, when you're, when you're meeting, willing to take the extra time and effort to, to try to create uh, meaningful relationships. Absolutely. Yeah. And, it, it, and you said it, it's time. And don't build, don't try to build relationships when you, the time is I need money right now because everybody smells desperation. Everybody smells this kind of like, it, it just comes through. So you really want to give yourself time to build these relationships. And then finally, before I go to the Q and A, you know, Jennifer, everybody thinks VC, everybody thinks it's a be all and end all. I need to be the founder. I need to be the face to stay in this world. But it's not necessarily, everybody's not meant to be a founder. Everybody doesn't need to be a founder. There's other ways to be a part of it. Talk about, you know, what, knowing yourself and thinking through what are the paths in this, in this sphere? Yeah, so I, I mentor students all the time, undergrad and grad. And, um, and when I talk to them about their careers, I remind them it's a journey, right? There's not one moment in time to be an entrepreneur. Um, I like to ask them how much school debt they have, because I think, and we talked about this earlier, I think that can really shape what your first job is going to be. And it might make a lot of sense to go to a Facebook, Amazon, Google, you know, that pays you well and allows you to work that down. Um, I talk about the value of getting a graduate degree. So I think, um, I mean, some schools offer one-year master's, which is very compelling. And, you know, the application process is streamlined. So especially for women and underrepresented minorities, I just feel like it it jumps them up, right? It really um, is an accelerant for their career. Um, PhDs can often be paid for, right? With, you know, stipends and scholarships. So, you know, that might be an attractive way to get your graduate degree. But in general, I think that, um, you know, people have very different paths. They might wanna to go to corporate research. They might wanna take a development job first. They might wanna join a startup before they are a founder of a startup. I and mean, there's, no, there's no rush to make it happen, you know, right out of school. Um, and there's, you know, lots of folks along the way that will kind of shape your journey. Yes, absolutely. And, and we've talked about, you know, in, in the Black community, especially in this country, you know, coming from friends and family with deep pockets where it gives you the ability to take that risk uh, is not always the case. And so do not feel like that that if you don't have that, you can't get to it, but you can just do it in, in a different path. And there, there is time, again, there is time to really kind of go about it and build your path. Building relationships is key. So I wanna turn it over to some of the Q and A uh, questions we have. Uh, here's one that I think is, is a good one. How do we build equity, parentheses, equality in equity uh, percent ownership and salaries at early stage startups with a mix of diverse and non-diverse founders? Again, thinking through kind of all of the things that we've talked about and potential barriers and obstacles that we're dealing with. How do we think about building equity when you're building it from the beginning? Anybody? I'll throw it open. Um, I can start. I mean, despite what I just said about you can wait, I do believe in the power of being a founder, right? So one reason why we focus on um, women and underrepresented minorities and our fellows is like, we want them to be founders, right? Because I think then they're gonna have an equal amount of that equity. So we're not just looking at, is there one person on the executive team? Oh, you know, that's great, it's diverse. Like not really when you look at the cap table. 
Um, so trying to, um, to really change things from the root, I think is important. Yeah, and, and, I, would, and I would say even, you know, I think the starting point even before that is just getting people in the door, right? Like of getting people in that founder seat. I think, you know, being able to negotiate the equity, um, I think is a, is a critical point, but you can't negotiate the equity if you're not as a you know, part of that, I think, initial team. Um, and then I think there's another big opportunity, you know, yes, the initial team is important, but there's a sort of second wave, I would say, of, of people that are now coming in on the commercialization side and thinking about that as well. And so I think being able to really demonstrate value of demonstrating, you know, hey, this is what I can bring to the table, uh, I think gives you a really good leverage position for, uh, for that negotiation. Absolutely. Um, a question here, do universities with larger commercialization teams have an advantage um, over smaller universities uh, that, that don't? And if, if somebody's at the smaller university, what can they be thinking about to do to, to get themselves on the radar? Um, Ed? Yeah, so I've represented universities, I've represented faculty, the VCs making the investment and the founding teams. And one of the things that we don't talk a lot about is the university instructs the tech transfer office to treat faculty members differently based on, wait for it, whether that faculty member is a huge revenue producer for the university and whether that faculty member is tenured and has clout. And clout comes from a number of things, but it comes heavily from revenue generation for the university, depending on the university. So a larger commercialization team might not be an advantage. Understanding the internal politics is a huge advantage for you in figuring out what's going to happen. And I remember years ago, I was representing university tech transfer office. We had a thorny issue and the head of tech transfer said to me, wait a minute, this faculty member isn't even on tenure track. Why am I even talking about this deal? And that was an eye-opening situ situation. Um, so I, I don't know that they have um, an advantage. I, I, one, one thing I, I just, on the equity conversation, Ida, your comment earlier about, you know, seeing it yields being it. If you are looking at a venture fund, and the only diversity on their website is from people who are support staff, not investors at the fund. And the only diversity among the founders that they've backed is like some you know, deal that they did last month and it's the first time in 20 years that they've done that. That fund is going to be a hard sell for you if you are underrepresented. And I hate to say it, and the bias is not implicit. They're on notice. They know who they've hired. They know the deals in their pipeline. It's explicit bias that they haven't done anything to redress. So look for investors who have spoken about your space, who understand your space, and who have also done deals that demonstrate that they care about diversity, equity, and inclusion that's more likely to get you in a situation where the equity splits will be equitable and it's more likely to be fertile ground for building those relationships that Sydney was talking about in my experience. I'm not saying you shouldn't try the others. I just think, you know, the odds are not as high. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Intention. Intentionality is, leads to where you write your checks. So you're absolutely right looking at that. It is as much on you as the founder to look on who you're going to take money from because, you know, this is eight to 10 year kind of relationships you're talking about. Um, and, you know, you tokenization happens, but you don't necessarily want to be that unless, you know, somebody could really meaningfully be ready for that and want to be doing it. Uh, and I, we're all about being trailblazers here and being open because people can change, but sometimes the, the data and the track record kind of say otherwise. So uh, that's absolutely true. Um, question uh, that's come in. Uh, okay, let's talk about how can universities 
best help academic founders connect with prospective funders in meaningful ways? You know, will funders invest time in building relationships with academics, especially non-faculty members? So, you know, what what is on the onus of the academic institutions uh, to to foster and build that bridge to really help uh, close these gaps, especially for Black founders and and, and entrepreneurs? Cindy, thoughts? Or Rachel, thoughts, actually? No, I haven't heard from you in a bit. Yeah, I can give two seconds and then hand it over to Rachel. Um, I, I, mean, I mean, I think the short answer is stuff like this is really, really impactful and really cool, right? I, I think the, the reach of an event like this, um, you know, I think the struggle is always time, right? So for the investors, there's only so much time for the investors. And so doing it on an individual basis is hard. Uh, and so being it's the, the more you can give a, a you know, one to many relationship in terms of giving advice or information or whatever it is, especially at the early stage when it's not necessarily actionable. Um, and then giving the opportunity to follow up and learn more when when they're like sort of getting toward an action point. So um, Rachel. Sure. Um, I would just add, I think one piece is transparency and process. So, um, you know, making sure that academic potential academic founders know you know where the commercialization office even is and who the who the people are you go to and talk to and what that process looks like adding that transparency and making it accessible is really important um and then to piggyback off of sydney's comment i agree there's an there's an element of these institutions have tons of alumni who become founders and tons of alumni who become funders. And there's many opportunities to find ways to pair those groups and, and to, to, to sort of make those connections. And I think particularly thinking about like Office of Alumni Services and things like that, that's an opportunity that I think sometimes gets missed when there's panels of lawyers or panels of doctors. There's like um, creating those, the, the, those moments, those meaningful moments of connection um, and giving people access um, you know, everyone touts how great their alumni networks are. They're only great if they're sort of working actively um, to support those in the institution and those coming from the institution. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think one great one that we can kind of wrap with is given that what we're talking about, the importance of IP and all of that, how do you share what you're thinking about early without putting your you know, you guys talked about doing it from a legal standpoint, doing it from like getting an early traction without putting your idea at risk. How do you do that? Ida, can I answer that and offer Please. a little bit of a contrarian yeah. opinion? <laughs> um, <clears throat> I think IP, and I think the lawyers are gonna be mad at me, but I think it's actually less important today. And it's often more about execution and how well you understand the customer and the pain point and the solution. And so you could actually leave a university setting without IP and create your own, right? You know, based on your deep domain knowledge, based on the, you know, the quality of your team and how well you understand the customers. So for those folks who might be in a situation where they don't have leverage, you know, with the tech transfer office, because they're not generating revenue for the university or, or the idea is still kind of evolving, I still think that they can go off without IP. Lawyers, do you have a... <laughs> I, I will um, sidestep Jennifer's comment just for a second to say my understanding is that the IP theft that academics and grad students in particular should be worried about is um, you put your idea out there, some other faculty member does the research and pursues your thesis and takes credit for it. And there is a misogynistic overlay here in that my understanding is that women are definitely having their research, their hypothesis stolen by, by male faculty members. Um, and so you're probably more at risk in that arena than you are in um, response to Jennifer's question as a practical matter when you're taking IP um that you developed in the course of your research that's sort of less of a legal opinion and a little more of a practical opinion but that's my sense of it interesting interesting well i mean i like i have many more questions and we didn't even get to all of them in the in the chat but this was fantastic uh and as don put in the chat later today there are going to be breakout sessions right this is that opportunity to start meeting people to expand your network to start plant that day one that will with time you can grow. And I, you know, I feel 
honored that Princeton has given us this platform and wants to bring all kinds of universities together. Um, and as a, a proud Black alumna, I am really excited to be partnering with all of the universities and all of the investors that want to be putting money behind supporting Black entrepreneurs, academic and otherwise. So thank you so much for joining our session and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, everybody on the panel. Yeah.